I'm now 43 this year and I'm actually going to be selling my house and moving back in with my parents. So uh, this was, it's quite a difficult decision really, um, but it's due to the cost of living. Um, I'm finding that I was just working all hours and being quite stressed out from work and actually not having the time to even enjoy living in my home. Mm. Um, My mum and dad are on a variable rate mortgage so theirs has been going up in this morning when I heard it had gone up again. My instant thought was about their affordability. Mm. Um, so actually for both of myself and my parents, the best idea for us is if I move in with them and we all pay a mortgage together, I don't have to work all hours and try and look after a house at the same time without getting any time for myself. So it takes a or, bit of pressure off both, yeah. both of you, all of you. And remind yeah, me, your own home, do you own it or were you renting it, did you say? Own it, yeah. You own it. So yeah, you'll sell so that, I mean, will you? Yes, and the thought of like not having a, a mortgage and being able to get one again is quite scary. But at the same time, um, I've only got one life and, you know, we need to live it. And mm. I just feel like I'm not living. I'm just surviving on yeah. working and paying the bills. Um and then, you know, my mum and dad are struggling as well, but I wouldn't have been able to, I've got lots of options, so I feel really lucky, but I wouldn't have been able to um, buy a house in the first place if it hadn't been for my mum and dad. Uh, they gave both me and my brother deposit to buy our houses. Yeah. And you've got, then you'll have some equity from that, won't you, to underpin yeah. things? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's that pressurised, is it, work at the moment, just working to stand still, really? So, yeah, so stressful um, in my particular job that I've been doing and um, to the point it's made me quite unwell physically and uh, mentally um, and I, I didn't really f- I feel like I had a choice but to stop working there and, and, and um, can I ask what break. line of work you're in I mean you don't need to give me any detail particularly no no it was in health and social care right okay say no more <laughs> yeah I voted to leave and I still would if the question came up again um, why be, well let's start from the top if you look at the um, the American USA flag, it's stars and stripes. The stars are arranged in this famous sort of lattice oh, formation. Oh, God, sure. I haven't got, but, I'm really sorry, my friend. I haven't <laughs> got the time for that. Why would you vote again tomorrow to leave? Because there's, um, as it gets, well, the stars were originally arranged in a circle uh, on a blue background, exactly identical to the European Union flag, which could, which, no, it tells me there's a continuation of an ideology that's going on. Oh, for God's got sake, a, Philip. I've got a book here called by Noam, someone called Noam Chomsky. Um, it's called, again, in the old best, subtitled, America's Quest for Global Denomination. Domination. <laughs> Why uh, ask, you know, do you think it's a coincidence that the European Union flag is an identical copy of the American Union flag as it was during the Civil War? Is that a coincidence? Or did the designers of the European Union flag say, well, that's a pretty pattern, let's adopt that? Or do you think perhaps, you know, flags have a, a, a design to reflect the ideology involved behind the state or government involved? It's a simple question. <laughs> can, I I give you, can I give you my answer? Go on. Oh, God. He's gone. Your wife's a teacher, is that right? Good morning. She is, mate. Yes, good morning. Yeah. Um, it's causing a massive debate in our household. Uh, <laughs> I can be quite opinionated in my point of view good. as much as she can. Um, so mm. she waited until Friday to tell me that she was striking, <laughs> purely because she didn't want me to argue with her. Right. Um, she's asked me to get on board with her point of view, so I've taken what she said. Mm. Now, she said it's for the kids. Mm-hmm. so that they can have better school supplies and everything else. Everything I've, I've then so gone away, read about it, listened about it to LBC, mm-hmm. looked online, and everything points to teachers wanting more wages. Mm-hmm. So I've gone back to her, and she said, well, they're taking the 5% pay rise out of the school budget. As I've informed her, a business will run and take wages out of a budget that well, they have set for the year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's then going to affect the kids because they then can't afford some of the supplies they need. So realistically, I've said to her, if you were arguing for more funding for the school kids, I would probably be more on board with it. She's on 40 grand a year, right. near enough, right. Right. which 
it's more than I'm on. I'm a lorry driver. Right. Um, so she's the breadwinner. Fair enough. Not a problem. Um, but she has a lot of holiday throughout the year. Which, again, that's <laughs> oh, the career. Oh, my God. Teachers are going to be... Re- oh, yeah. You're a brave so man because when you say that, they go bloody nuts at me, I tell you. But go ahead. You're married to one. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I live on the edge. <laughs> you do. You do. You can get in your but truck they... and drive off to Aberdeen for a few days. <laughs> As I've told her, though, she works from sort of half five and she normally gets home at uh, half eight and then she normally gets home about six. So she's probably leaving off about half five. Yeah. Um, and she's paid from half eight till half three. So I've, as I said to her, those two hours, if you add that up, somebody who works in a shop as a manager or whatever and gets 40 grand, for example, um, and the amount of holiday she has and the amount of extra hours she does, it probably works out similar to an average person who goes out and earns 40 grand a year yes. you know, in some yeah. business and whatnot. But it's just crazy, really. <laughs> but she gets 13 weeks holiday. Chris, good luck. Inheritance tax loopholes and the non-don status. Oh, God. But between them, 1.4 billion, 3.2 yeah. yeah, billion. We're looking for 21 billion. Away, been, We're been, looking been, for 21 billion, though, John. That's the cost. Don't you worry. I've got you. I've got you, Tom. <laughs> I'm going to get you I'm going to get you 300 billion. How's that? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I love it. Right. But it's going to have to so be very you're quick. Get, you're going to get your 1.4 from the inheritance tax loopholes. Yeah. You're going to get 3.2 from the non-DOM. Yeah. Then you're going to get somewhere in the region of 9, 8.5 on national insurance to, nas- to investment income. You're then going to get somewhere in the region of 15 from right. equalising capital gains with income tax. Wow. But the big one, and this is from the LSE uh, commission that was put together to discuss what, what was possible. They had two examples. They had a threshold of 1 million per household, assuming two individuals with 500k each and a rate of 1% per year on their wealth above that threshold. Okay, I got it. John, we're there. I'm not sure that adds up to 21. I'll do the maths in a few moments. But forgive me, I've got to leave it. My blood is boiling right now because I seem to wonder, we had an election in December 2019, which would shape the future of this country, Tom. And it seems at the moment we're being usurped by the Supreme Court, the ECHR, Strasbourg, and just about anybody else who wants to throw in the kitchen sink and dictate United Kingdom government policy. Now, the last time I looked, we had five years of this government. We're into year number four. Now, if people don't like the measures that this Conservative government are taking, Tom, they have a simple solution in 12 months' time to make it known in the ballot box. Oh, they will. They in the meantime, will. sir, in the meantime, the UK government, which was elected on a vast mandate and increased share of the vote, has got to decide what the law is of this country. Not Strasbourg, not Brussels, not France, and not lunatic lefty lawyers, Tom. But there will be people, Adam, who will reasonably say, how can Parliament make a legitimate assessment of safety of a particular country. Look at its track record. Look at what those agencies that work in there are saying about it. Well, Tom, forgive me for sounding cynical, but at the end of the day, these people, human beings who want to jump on a boat and come across to the UK, putting themselves at danger when there is absolutely no danger in France. So if these people do not want to abide by the law, then clearly well, the United there Kingdom is no prerogative is no legal requirement for, for an individual people. to claim asylum in the first safe country they come to. There is no legal requirement for them to do so. That is semantics beyond it, unbelievability. How Tom? is it semantics? It's, because it's the it's law. Because people are playing the law to their advantage. The spirit of the law is being absolutely trashed, and I can't wait so Rishi Sunak's Conservative government introduces new legislation to take back control. Love to the family. I've been a police officer for a long time now. I've just seen it become going from being very, very good to being absolutely terrible. There are five problems with the police. Five problems? OK, Pay, hit me. Well, experience, training and ex- um, leadership. Mm. So... I'd love you to play the clip when Theresa May was warned by the Police Federation that, that what her, her cuts would have consequences and she told the Met Federation they were crying wolf. And her, 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 what her words have come to bite her in the back. In bite her in the back. So first is experience. 
we have no experienced police officers left. All the sensible police officers left, all the good police officers left. We now have ne- nearly 50, 60, 70% of all frontline police officers have less than four years. Service. James, just to jump in, why, why did they leave? Why would you stay? Your pay is cut, your pension's taken away from you. Why would you stay? If you, so, so the 20 odd years of policing, I'm at quite a high rank, I'm earning less than £60,000 a year. Right. And you've you seen, you've seen in that. that time your force, your colleagues, effectively decimated? Well, people just, people just come to work and cry because they can't cope. It's awful. People who are good people, you pay, mon- you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. The pay in the police is terrible. 26% pay freeze I've had. So a cut, a cut over, of the, the pay freeze the cuts. Mm. So I'm 26% now. The junior doctors go on strike, everyone else has gone on strike. The police cannot Well, strike. that's the thing is you so can't go on strike. Over We're over a barrel, so the government can do what the heck they want to us because they can and they do, and they hate us. Ever since Pledgate, ever since we looked at Leveson, all those things, the government decided they despise the police. The Tories hate the police. Their actions show it very clearly. Well, of course they they'd say they're the party of law and order. They're the party that's yeah, recruiting 20,000 new officers. Every part of the criminal justice system is absolutely broken. They have completely smashed probation, courts, barristers, police, CPS, youth justice, Everything has broken. It's completely destroyed under this government. They have destroyed the police. And, you, and you're saying, James, broken. that that is entirely because of the funding cuts we saw at the start of the day. It's a hundred percent of the cuts. If you're pen- if you, if I told you you're going to work for thirty years, and end of it you get a nice pension, you take the rubbish hours, you take the rubbish conditions. Mm. But if you if you came to my station and saw it stinks of urine because the sewer system doesn't work, and I have to work in there all the time, the aircon doesn't work, everything's broken. So everything is bad. And the only good thing about it, it used to be that we could put villains away. That was, the, what, that was the, all that kept us going, putting villains in prison, because I hate villains. I hate them. And yet every single day I can't do it because something doesn't work. 4% detection rate on crimes, that's embarrassing. It's utterly shameful as a country that we're there. I'm ashamed to be a police officer, not only because of people like Carrick, but it's because of the leadership we've had appeasing the politicians. Bernard Hogan Howe, hang your head in shame. You were put into place as a hatchet man and you destroyed the police with your mate, Theresa May. All the experience gone. The training's woeful. They've closed all the training centres down. Hendon's gone. Wrighton's gone. All gone. The police officers get trained at universities by people who want police officers to do police work. Mm. All the street craft gone. Peter Kirk, Peter was right. You know, you learn by osmosis as a police officer. You learn by watching other people who are better at their job than you are teaching how it's done. You know, if everyone's under 25 years old and less than two years service on a team, going out, pushing uniform cars around all day long, what do you think is going to happen? You haven't got an old hand saying, son, this is how it's done. How, how big a problem is that, James? Because the government will say, look, these, these figures, the fact that crimes aren't being tackled, that's exactly why we are increasing numbers again. We're recruiting 20,000 20, police officers. But it's not okay, just so, about so, numbers, is it? So, so, so say, for example, you are a, a, a professional football team and you've got the world's best, you know, you've built a team and built a team and built a team. Then you let all your stars go for free and you play your under-16 team. That's what's happened to the police. So how do you expect the police officers to be able to... So, you know, you don't replace, you know, Neymar with little Johnny who's playing within the 14s. You replace, ne- you replace Neymar with Mbappe. That's how it goes. And then the police, we just lost all the experience. You don't expect people mm. to learn. You le- it takes five years to become a good detective. So Minimum even with numbers years. having increased almost yeah. to where they were well, 13 years ago, you're saying it's attention. going to take years for that expertise and that experience to be built up again? No, but, the, but they, won't have, they won't have the expertise. It's gone. All the, all the arts of being a police officer, how to work people over, how to, how to, how to interview people, how to question people, how to, you know, how to get people on side, turn them into informants. All of those things have gone. Well, that's really gone. frightening. That's really frightening, it, James, it, because what you're then. telling me is even in a few years, even 10 years, that institutional insight, that institutional experience still won't be there because the people who would normally pass it on to the next generation have gone. They've, yeah, they've, they've thrown the baby out of the bathwater. That's what they've done. They've thrown it all out. <sighs> It's, it's, no, it's, I, can't, I can't begin to tell you how bad it is. And there are people like me, 20 odd years left, so in, instead of working 30 years, I've got to work 40 years for less pension from, and for worse, worse conditions. The whole system is broken. Our leadership is awful. They're not police officers anymore. They're a bunch of college entrants who think they know what they're talking about because they, their leadership is playing second 11 hockey at school and they were the captain. You know, it's, 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 I can't begin to tell you the whole 
police system is you, broken. You're doing a pretty good never, job. You're doing a pretty good job of expelling it out, James, and it's and it's pretty terrifying, frankly, because it's, it's not a short term thing. Can I just ask you about practicality? We're talking about crimes like assault. We're talking about crimes like burglary, criminal damage. From your experience, if you were in the station and a call comes in about a theft, a burglary, an assault, harassment, realistically, what what happens? So, uh, you, so you listen to that uh, blast to it, try and do what they can, but they're so short staffed. They're so so when people, when, the, when the Tories talk about we're increasing police officers, what the most important thing, and Peter touched on this, they've cut the police staff, the mm. support staff, the, the people who worked out the duties, the people who worked out the payroll, the people who did all those things, you know, how to build write, writing paperwork, all of those things are now done by police officers who cost twice as much. So if you've got a, a, someone who's got more than ten years in the police as a council, they get paid forty thousand pounds a year. Okay. You get two typists for £20,000, but you've got a police officer doing the typist work, role worse than the typist coach. Does that make sense? So yeah. all, that, all that police staff who were brilliant have all gone. All that experience has gone because they, were, they weren't police officers, so police officers can't be sacked, whereas civil, where, where the police staff can. They're all booted out. So police officer numbers are high, but they're all doing desk jobs. They're all doing desk jobs. So if you looked at the, you know, the actual effectiveness of your workforce, they're all behind desks and all, all the people, bonkers. all the experiences. It's, it's, so all the experiences away from the front line and the entire, and the entire front line are headless lambs being, being, being sent for slaughter every single day by incompetent leaders. Oh, James, that is the one of the most damning, devastating, eviscerating calls that I think I've ever taken on LBC about the state of policing and how politicians and police leaders have allowed it and enabled it to get so bad. I knew things were bad. I've got to admit, I didn't know they were as bad as the picture you've just painted. And I find it pretty terrifying because what it means is as police numbers increase again, as investment goes up again, the problems aren't going to go away because that expertise, that institutional experience that is so key in any organisation, particularly one like police force, has gone irreversibly. And I find that really, really concerning. James, really interesting to speak to you. As concerning as your call was, I'm really glad you called in because that's the picture that we need to see. That's the account that we need to hear. I've never voted in my life. So what? I know. Dave, I get... Dave, Dave, yeah. Dave, Dave, Dave. I think what you said, a lot of people will be cheering to the echo. And the fact that VAT is so swinging and the fact that it's so tough in the supermarkets. Why have you never voted? Because I don't trust them. They're all the same. But the other thing is. If okay. I could make How are you going to put it right, Dave? I'm not. I'm too old. Well, but, you're never you too know, old. Okay. Well, but can what I about bring if, on my Assuming point? you have children, no. don't, don't you want to put it oh, right? Oh, yeah, I've got grandchildren. Well, yeah. don't you want to put it right for him, her or them? No, I've advised my daughter and son to emigrate because the country is going to the, the dogs. But okay. can I also do one other thing yeah. on the um, sure. immigrant you know, the illegal immigrant crisis. Why good. hasn't anyone, you know, all these boffins in Whitehall got, you know, degrees from Cambridge, Oxford and Excuse all the rest of it. Mm. Why haven't they just done the simple thing of sending a secret band of people over to this Europe be, and buy up all the um, dinghies? rubber dinghies? Oh, I love that this. Come, and then that's it. They don't, they don't have to right. do anything else. Right. Um, Dave... You know yeah. that in some instances they can get 30 or 40 people on board one of those dinghies and they're paying, I understand, somewhere in the region of £5,000 or euros yeah. each. OK, yeah. so that boat is netting hundreds of thousands. Do you not think they'd find somewhere else to buy themselves a rubber dinghy? Well, we, you know, we've got to be ahead of it. We've got to think so like the We've got to criminal. buy up every rubber dinghy in... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it'd be Do you know what? I haven't got up so early. I didn't think I was going to have a laugh this morning. That, that... <laughs> spending five, six million pounds a day on keeping right. them in hotels. Yeah, OK, because they'd never find a dinghy anywhere on mainland Europe, would they, Dave? Well, that would be the objective. OK. Look after the children and grandchildren, Dave. Thank you. I was going to say people like that have the vote, but Dave doesn't vote anyway. Uh, Dave, I'm going to file that under It's an Idea, um, but I don't think it will necessarily work. I teach in a school in the deprived area, and a couple of weeks ago, um, we were doing potato. You carve a potato, you dip it in some paint, you put it on some paper. Yes. And the kid said, Miss, what are you going to do with the little bits of potato that are left over from the potato printing? I said, yeah. well, I'm going to bin it. And the child said to me, Miss, can I take it home? Oh. Because my mum hasn't got much in the cupboard, so can I eat these bits of potato that are left over? Oh, so to me, 
I can I can suck it up by saying yes, Mrs. Thatcher changed Britain. I can agree with that because the important thing is that we need to get these characters out of government. We need to get these trust disillusioned Tories to vote Labour. That's the important thing. And then once, please God, we're in power, then we can put pressure on Starmer to try and um, um, do a platform that I'd put. be happier with. It's but, beautifully um, put. How confident are you? I mean, and you're not allowed to say, well, he couldn't make it worse, all right? So how confident are you that Starmer will improve that lad's life? I'm confident because I was at Labour conference and I heard really inspirational people speaking about um, how they're going to change things. So one of the big ones, Harvey, a lot of the children I teach, there's a families where there's a lot of domestic violence. Yeah. And one of the things, one of the missions will, the aim is to halve violence against women and girls. And the idea of the missions, I'm not sure everyone has kind of got it. It's no, that you knows, get education, yeah. you get the police, you get the NHS, you get everybody, all the organs of the state working on this mission to try and try and make this happen and for some of the children I teach who are escaping domestic violence even even if we don't manage to do halving domestic violence but the thing is at least Starmer and Yvette Cooper and you know just at least these people care about domestic violence at least this is something that's that that they want to try and fix whereas our current lot it's they're 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 wanging on about um the Elgin marbles and you know that the, the, the people on the, it so yes absolutely sometimes for me it is really difficult um stuff like the two child benefit cap yeah. it's really difficult but i'm out here every week banging on doors because i know that labor is the only chance that children like the ones i teach have got you're amazing that, that was, I mean, that I, I feel like you've just injected something into my veins, actually. Uh, and uh, drawing on not just the context of where you've been canvassing, but on the perspective that you have as a teacher in a deprived area, looking after children who are scraping potato off the classroom floor effectively. That, that was an absolutely extraordinary contribution. The last caller says, look, she's done very little for Scotland. Things have gone worse. Oh, my Walk God. around Edinburgh. Walk around. Tell me why you disagree with that and what she has done. Well, um, I can name quite a lot of things that she has done. Well, one, she's been there. She's been a constant for Scotland. We have better, edu- we have ed- uh, free education in Scotland compared to down south. We have um, free free meals for our ki- uh, our kids. We have free prescriptions. We have so many things that down south don't like. For instance, I'm a nurse. And as a nurse, we actually was paid slightly more um, under an SNP government. We also have, um, uh, we, we had the bursary that w- was never taken away, which down south did. Um, we've got a lot more social policies um, better than what um, down south have. She also stopped things like the, the, the road um, pole, uh, you know, the road... Uh, Oh, the, um, you know when you had to pay to cross to go to Sky and all that type of thing, all that was. W- w- there's so many things that they've done better with C- a little Kirsty, bit they why, can. Why do. do you think she's leaving? I do not know, but there's been a lot of lots of people upset over this trans thing as well. Um, do you think she handled I, that well or poorly? I don't think it was really. I think the whole lot was blamed on her when. There's a lot of unionists out there that, where it comes from the Labour Party, whether it comes from the Liberal Democrats, where it comes from all unionist parties, they like to um, make fire. But hang on a minute, hasn't the party been divided over this issue? Come on, I mean, it's not Not, just all about externalities and unionist perspectives. The the, the party has been divided over this issue. Yeah. I'm not disputing that. I'm even divided over that. I'm not disputing that. Right. But she's got the blame for something that has been a cross party. That's the point I'm trying to make out. The fact is this was voted on by the majority of MPs, whether they be SNP, Greens, Liberals and Labour Party, even people in the Greens. I think the Green represent, not the Green, the... the, the um, a Tory in in this area, who's a, a, M, M, a MSP, he voted for trans uh, gender, and he was a Tory. So the point I'm trying to make is 
there's a lot to get blamed. And SNP, it, it, it doesn't matter. They don't play with a... We, we do not get... E- uh, e- e- equality here in, in Scotland or in the United Kingdom and me as a Scot I don't feel that even anything that the Scots vote for down south don't care because they've got the majority and they will do with what they will want. Kirsty? No matter even though we have we have voted to, ha- to remain in Europe we've been taken out against our will and the fact is that maybe I'm sad to see her go but if she has to go, the cause isn't dead. And I think that's what unionists... This is the independence cause, the independence cause. It'll never die, no. How do you think your refusal to negotiate with us improves morale or standards of care? Well, Olivia, thanks for everything you and your colleagues do. You obviously do a fantastic job. I was talking earlier in the show about you know, my family's involvement in the NHS and how personal it is to me. So thank you for that, first of all. We're all reliant on you, and it was uh, a great privilege to celebrate 75 years with the NHS recently. Now, look, you, you and I, sadly, are just going to disagree on this, but you know, I'm proud of what we've done. We've invested record sums in the NHS since I became Prime Minister. Uh, not only that, just the other week we announced the first ever long-term workforce plan for the NHS so we can uh, deliver something that has been asked for for decades and for the first time as Prime Minister I've delivered it, which means that we will train more doctors, more nurses, more of everyone in fact, dentists, GPs, everything, um, so we're less reliant on foreign trained clinical staff. So that's the right long term thing for the country that I've done and prioritised and put funding behind. Um, And we're reforming how the NHS works to get people the care they need uh, and supporting you and your colleagues to do that. But more staff are leaving. Uh, They're jetting off to Australia. uh, Actually, actually far fewer than people think. And we looked at that. We looked at that as part of uh, considering how to reform the workforce. And that is a smaller phenomenon than people think. And, you know, some of Olivia's colleagues have done that, but it's not the vast majority. So we think the the current policy is right. But what I would say is, look, uh, over a million NHS workers have accepted the government's pay deal, many of them on salaries and incomes far lower than consultants and indeed Olivia and her colleagues. That's just the reality of it. And I'm really grateful to them, the million NHS workers, you know, the several unions, all of whom accepted the government's offer and and the millions of other public sector workers like teachers and others who have also accepted the government's offer based on recommendations from the independent pay review bodies, not the government's view. This is an independent recommendation. Government accepted it. All these other unions and millions of public sector workers, including NHS, have accepted it. Now, there are a few exceptions, including junior doctors and consultants. That's what's causing the waiting list to go up. I don't think that's right. I would say to them, I'm very grateful and respectful of the incredible job you do, but we all have a shared mission to bring the waiting list down. I've done my bit by backing the NHS with a long-term workforce plan and record funding, and I would ask people to think about accepting what is an independent offer and and coming to come and do the thing that I know you want to do, which is serve patients. Let's get a quick response from a a woman who's on the front line. Quick response, Olivia, if you would, before we move on. Olivia? I think it's... Amazing that we're blaming the increasing in waiting lists on doctors um, going on strike. Um, You're losing staff because we're undervalued and it's not just doctors, it's everyone. We're all leaving. A happy workforce is your responsibility. You're the prime minister. You're the government. Your staff aren't happy. That's your fault. And ultimately, that's not good for patients because retaining staff is one of the bedrocks of making sure that you have good patient safety. You cannot keep the NHS running with the staff shortages that it has. And to keep us here, you have to keep us happy. That is your job. None of us are happy. I would would just say, Olivia, so if you look when you have the time, please go look at the long term workforce plan. It was it's the NHS. I've read it. I've read it. I get it. It's great. I love the fact that you're bringing in tons of new people, but there's going to be no one there to train or educate or supervise them. And you cannot be safe without senior staff on the wards training, educating and supervising. So there's three there's three there's three parts of the plan, actually. So one is to train more people. The second one is to retain more people. So there's a whole section of the plan about improving retention, which I agree with you is important. And the third part of it is reforming how we work. And I think right. you said you're working in A&E as well. One of the things we're introducing are uh, anaesthetist associates, which are a new role which will help uh, provide high quality care to people. But look, fundamentally, y- you and I are not going to agree because your union is asking for a 35% pay rise. 
I don't think that's reasonable. I don't think that's affordable. I don't think that's fair. Right. And millions of others have accepted the recommendations. And I would urge your union to do the same. I live out in Germany and I always try to convince people to get out of England. If you've got, if you're, if you've got the benefit of having some sort of European uh, golden ticket, I call it, I've got an Irish passport. Yeah. You can come and live over here and work over here. There's industry here. Um, the healthcare works. As soon as I came out here, I, I haven't seen a doctor for 10 years. As soon as I come out here, I've had a full body MOT dentist. I've had an MRT. Uh, the list goes on. If I need to see a doctor, it's, it's like the stories I hear from my parents. I know my doctor by his name. I can go down and see my doctor when I want to see my doctor. Right. Um, something you can't get in England. Um, another why thing why did like you move there, Alfie? My, my missus is German. Okay, that's it. But, then. Um, so you're 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 very happy there now, and you've settled. Well, she 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 came to England, but she was losing her hair. I was living in London, and I'm from London, and she was like, "Yes, London, I can't wait." Got over it within six months. She was like, "I need to leave this country." Why? Why did she feel and, that? Uh, way? Just through through the stress of being in England, and and you know what? I'll be honest with you. When I moved out to Germany, I had a realization, and I thought, you know what? I feel as if I've been living a lie my whole life. I've always been told how England's the best country in the world. We got the best army in the world. We got the NHS. We've got this. We... When I left that country, I literally look back and think, we are living a lie. In, well, you guys are living a lie. I'm not no longer. I have got a more surprise for you. Go on. We are transferring our prisoners from the Ben Marsh and also Ben Wolf. I used to work as a taxi driver to the hospital by taxi. I used to go regularly. I used to work for a firm in London. I used to go regularly inside the Ben Marsh and pick up the prisoners and take to the hospital. And after the third time, I speak with one of the prisoners on the way, and I find out he's a murderer. I was really scared. And I asked the taxi firm to do not send me anymore to the prison to pick up them. And I'm really surprised this should be happened well before. And not, I mean, until now, nothing happened. And this, this incident, this is, this is well before. I don't think so. Any country is they sending the prisoners with the high crimes by taxi to the hospital. This is, um, this is I, I, you know, I don't want to undermine how serious this story is, but I, I'm only laughing out of shock, really. And when you first got a call saying, hello, we need a taxi to take a prisoner from Belmarsh, which, as far as I'm aware, is a Cate prison, isn't it? So the most serious, hardened criminals are kept there. We, we need a taxi to take them to the local hospital. What I mean, what was your reaction, Sean? I'm surprised you didn't turn the job down for a start. Well, and also I have, I have to tell you this. After the second time, the officers, they knew me. They never searched my car. After the second time I've been to the, to the, uh, to the Van Wolf, they never searched my car. They just let me in. What? Yes, yes, yes. But was there ever a security check done on you to find out who no, you were? it's just the car. I was waiting in the car, go inside the gate... Parked my car, coming off the car, they searched the car. They said to me, doesn't need to, just sit and drive in. So I sit back in the car and drive in. Wait, did I hear that's you right? Simple. Did you say it's Belmarsh Prison? Yes, that's right. Wendorf, Wendorf Prison. Wendorf Prison, they never searched. They just let me in. After the second time, they just, the officer just tell me, you don't need to, say, to be searched, just sit down. We are really busy outside the gate, so we need to get you quickly out. So please just go in and pick up their prisoners and back in. I'll try not to get into a rant here. Well, you can if you um, want. But oh, well, I probably will then. I am astonished by my feelings towards the coronation mm. in some ways. I've always felt that there was something inherently wrong about people having a position by virtue of birth, the notion of royal blood. I think it's, it's nonsense. But I think one is just accepting of the monarchy when we had the Queen, the Queen was always there. The Queen was part of the furniture. The pageantry seemed to work with mm. the Queen in a way. But I find myself looking at our King and Queen and feeling an, an, a visceral rage, at, which really, doesn't really? come from nowhere. Yes, I, I look at them and I think, how very dare you? Um, and there's a kind of incongruence between these individuals... It's partly to do with that. I think it's also partly to do with the utter state of the country at the moment. 
public money being spent on this enormous great big junket when people are struggling to feed their families people are struggling to heat their houses it, it feels wrong and i think what it's done for me is it's just thrown into relief the horrendous inequalities and lack of social justice in this country i think brexit was perhaps the catalyst Brexit, in many ways, was based on the same faux patriotism that the monarchy um, gets its sort of oxygen from, if you like. Well, l- l- let me clarify that for the benefit of people listening. I know you're clear about what you mean, but you mean because I, I think that the-, that the Queen was pretty gutted by Brexit. Uh, by by, I mean, you have to read the runes and read between the lines. And Charles has made a, a-, a couple of interventions that would suggest he also understands the idiocy of it as a, as, a, as, a, as a national policy. But you're talking about how it was won. So the priority of flags and feelings over facts and evidence, that lends itself to Brexit and the royal family very neatly, doesn't it? People who are persuaded to care more about flags and feelings than they are about facts and figures, for example, are, are, are going to be likely supporters of both Brexit and the royal family. Yes, I think so. And I think Brexit and people's support for the monarchy are predicated on something which is not progressive. Mm. It's it's all about nostalgia. This idea of sovereignty is all about nostalgia. I actually saw leavers talk about, well, Britannia used to rule the waves. Yes. You know, wake up. We're in the 21st century. This is a country in decline. This is a country where there is a bigger gap between the haves and the have-nots than there's ever been. Actually, I'm really glad I've got this opportunity to speak to you. Um, I've worked as an emergency nurse for over 30 years. I'm now left um, disabled by long COVID because, you know, while we were busy on the front line, putting our lives on the line, and by the way, I lost three friends who sorry died to hear that. Very trying sorry to, to hear that. save people. But your government was busy doling out PPE contracts to all their mates, most of whom didn't produce a single piece of PPE, some of whom PPE that was pr- produced is now costing us millions to burn. Um, you have deliberately set about to defund and destroy the NHS from the moment you took office in government. Well, Karen, Karen, let prior me first... To you, no, prior to you taking government, uh, working in A&E, we hit the four-hour deadlines. We had very... We had the lowest waiting lists in history. We had the highest patient satisfaction and then you guys came in and dismantled it and saw an opportunity for each and every one of you for you to make money out of it and for you to get your friends richer out of it off the back of the people who are working on almost minimum wage we've got doctors on 14 pound an hour nurses start that were starting on 12 13 pound an hour and for what? Karen, let me first of all, let me thank you. I've heard you loud and clear. Thanks for sharing those views. Uh, first of all, let me say that yeah, I want to thank you for your service. And I'm sorry to hear about your three friends during the the, the, the pandemic. Uh, but you know, when it comes to the NHS, I, I, I'm not sure if you heard everything I said earlier, but spending on the NHS, even long before the pandemic, you know, is at the highest levels ever in real terms, in cash terms, no matter how you want to measure it. We spend as more than most other comparable countries on healthcare uh, in this country. Yet, uh, I, 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 I think most people would agree we're not getting the kind of outcomes that we'd want to see. And you also, you, write, you mentioned the issue about PP, and I, and I, and I get that, uh, what you're saying, but I, I can't agree with everything you've said about that, because because I think you have to think back to the start of this pandemic when PPE was absolutely necessary. Every country in the world had a shortage of PPE. And I think people would have expected their government at the time to do everything they can to get their hands on it. And you're right. They may well have brought too much. And you may well have to destroy that now. But I'd rather have a government that's buying too much than having too little. I don't think you're listening to me, Sajid. The stuff that you were providing was plastic, useless rubbish, gloves that you would put your hands through, aprons that were the thinnest I've ever seen. The PPE was shocking. It was not fit for purpose for most of the time, and it left us open to, to vulnerabilities. It's left me disabled, basically housebound now. I've gone from being a busy, working 12-hour shift in A&E, being out on my bike, 
going out kayaking, out with my kids, to someone who's now left in my home because your government failed to prepare me, um, to protect me. And also, you are also refusing to recognise it as an industrial um, illness, which it is. Because well, I wouldn't have got this if I hadn't have been facing COVID every yeah, well, single look, day. Well, Karen, again, I want to thank you for your service. And I'm sorry for the, the what you're facing now, what you've set out. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that the NHS's uh, issues uh, go you're way beyond uh, just the, the, the issues around COVID, whether it's PP and things. I think we have a more of a um, you know, structural uh, issue that needs to, to, to be addressed. I lost my dear wife after nearly 57 years of, uh, of marriage. Um, and I um, initially was obviously in shock and mm. I developed certain um, illnesses and a lot of problems with grieving and I developed mental health but bringing me up to date I've got through my mental health issue and I've got that. I've got through quite a lot of the grieving and um, all along um, I believed that with loneliness um, you have to believe in yourself that you you are wanting to try and do the best for yourself in the circumstances. I've not no family. Uh, I'm on my own after all these years. And it was a shock. Um, mm. When did you when did you lose your wife, John? Uh, December uh, 21, 30 right. December 21. It's about 18 uh, months ago. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was about the first 12 months. It was very it was difficult. Of but course. I believed I believed in people who wanted to help me. Um, and I started to um, get involved with um, certain charities who put me in touch with complete strangers who are now my best friends, um, who write to me, uh, telephone me, um, video Zoom. We talk over over video and um, uh, every week. Uh, and through through their contact with me, it has encouraged me to do better and it, is, it made me make a decision about four months ago, and that was for the memory of my dear wife. I, I would not do anything stupid. I would be positive. I would believe in myself. My wife is with me all the time. Mm. No matter where I am, she's with me. I feel a presence. Um, she supports me, and uh, we talk a lot. And um, I've developed a lot of hobbies. And... Um, Things like painting, drawing, um, painting by painting by numbers, writing, um, and I, I've, I've improved my reading. I go out for walks. Mm. I, I haven't joined any social groups at the minute because I'm not. I don't feel I'm quite ready for that, but I'm mm. trying to build my strength up through my. It's not independence, but through my my group that I've got together. Self confidence. Who, yes, self confidence who support me, but to anybody who is in my position where you've lost a dear one, I'll always remember that they're with you, and I'll always remember that they would want you to do your best for yourself, and they they will always look down on you, and they will they will they will always care over you, and don't be alone, don't feel alone, but when you feel alone. Try, try and look at positives. Um, I, I have some problems with positivity and negativity, but over time, I, I've managed to get rid of, of nearly all the negatives that I had uh, over, over the shock of losing my wife. And, and, and most of my things now are positive. Um, I feel down. You get down. You feel you have days where you, you don't want to do nothing. But when you get in that situation, just just put the, that foot forward in front of your right, and, and just kind of concentrate and try and try and do your best. Yeah, don't, don't life is not a mountain; it can be a hill. It, it can be something that you have you have. If you don't want to do something, don't do it. If you want to just sit down, sit down. If you want to go out, go go out. But believe in yourself. I, I know it's easy to say. 
He should need to say to you, believe in yourself, but please trust me. I find it works for me. Um, and, and by believing in myself, I've built up my confidence. And, and, and I, I, I honestly, the days go by, I, I don't get bored because I've got new things to do. I've got new ventures. I've got letters to write. I've got drawing to do. I've got writing to do. And, 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 and various other things that, that, that I take on board. And, and, and by, by believing in myself, by believing that my wife would want me to do what I'm doing, it's made me feel more confident in myself. Now, I'm not saying that's going to, everybody's going to get the same response because it, it affects different people in different ways. Hmm. You know, it, it's not, it's not a one fit measure for everybody. And I understand, I understand when people feel low and they feel down. But please remember, tomorrow will be a better day. And, and, and that, that's, how, that's how I work. If I want to cry, I cry. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to tell anybody I've cried my eyes out. Because that is love coming out to me from my wife. That's an expression of my love for my wife. And, and I've been out and I've started crying. And I'm not ashamed. Well, you shouldn't. And I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed now to talk to you um, or anybody else about it. But there is a, be, there is a better tomorrow. And, and, and just don't think every day is a mountain. You've got to climb a mountain. You haven't got to climb a mountain. You can get by by climbing a hill. And that's really, Lewis, all I want to say. But from the bottom of my heart to those people like me, Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. It hasn't got to be. It's sadness to lose somebody you love. But that person is always with you. And I wish everybody in my situation all the best. And you, you look after yourselves and try and do what you can for yourself. Sure. And you will find that you'll have bad days. And you'll have good days. But when the bad days come, just believe in that you can get over them. John, John, can I ask you, mm. what, was, what was your wife's name? Sorry? What was your wife's name, John? If you don't mind asking. Sheila. Sheila. Sheila, I think, John. We, I... Met, we, met, on a, we met on a blind date. Oh, really? It, in 1965, we met in the March. We got married in the October of the same year. Wow. That's 50, 57 years together. And I couldn't have had a better wife, and she she made she made me into who I was, who I am then now. She made me into a better person. I loved the socks off her. She she was the soul of my life. She was my 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 love. She was everything to me, and um, I would go through the fifty seven years again, and I I we had our ups and downs. Who didn't? You know, we we all. We all get it. We all live through it. But we believed in each other. And uh, we lived our life together. And well, uh, love, love her now. She's resting in peace. But uh, I can see her now as I'm talking to you. 